it's not too much security on Facebook. True. Cause like if you post a pic and like it can like tag you because like face recognition and all that. Uh, so like I don't know. I just don't trust. I don't trust it. And might I add, um, so people that don't know. I think Mark Zuckerberg kind of made a glitch somewhere. But if you're not friends with someone on Facebook and you go on their page for the first time, you're not going to see a lot of content. But if you keep going on their page, more will open up the more you keep going to their page. It's like the rabbit hole. Yeah, it's like you like you have to go to their page a certain amount of time Mm -hmm. to where it kind of like secretly makes you a friend. And then like Uh. you see more stuff as you keep going on. Same with Instagram. Like if you go on the, um, someone's Instagram, I've noticed this a lot. For a couple times, the first time, you don't see pictures that you saw mm-hmm. before, and they're old pictures, so it's not like they're posting. So it's already available. They just choose what they want to allow you to see. Yeah. Hmm. All right, Facebook. So um, it says that Libra will allow people to send money to each other without having a traditional middleman, such as a bank, a digital wallet called Calibra will also be available as a standalone app on Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Mm-hmm. So I do know that at this moment, you can already send money through Facebook. I, I've never done that before. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Facebook wants to be in the game. They want to be in every game. So I think, you know, with anything like, like you know, we have the driverless cars coming. Well, they're already here. It, it might not be for our generation particularly, but, you know, once, yeah. once it picks up and, oh, yeah. and, and people mm-hmm. get hooked to it, you know, it's a wrap. Arm robbers steal at least thirty million dollars of gold and precious me- metals in a San Pablo Paulo airport heist. Eight men targeted a cargo terminal uh, at San Paulo International Airport, driving two trucks that resembled those driven by Brazilian federal police. The agency said at the terminal, four men exited the truck wearing face coverings. Reported saying that at least one carried a rifle. The gunman left the airport with approximately 750 kilograms of gold and other metals due for shipment to Zurich and New York. No shots were fired and no one was injured during the robbery. Mm. Oh, some Grand Theft Auto stuff right there. Yeah. So, <laughs> multiple men with masks and one with a rifle just so, like happens to leave the airport mm-hmm. with no problem? No police brutality right there. Interesting. Uh-huh. Thirty million dollars worth of gold. Wow. Now gold is heavy though, so like I'm wondering like what that really like. What's the exchange like? Where are they taking this to? Where did they get it from? How did it's they a, get that's it? an inside job. How did they get in? That's an inside job. Who knows? That's Who's a set it off. There? That, that set it off too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You said T T W A. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's we need, we need a T W A connect. You see what the biz every day, every every time we're working on a, a scheme to get some money. <laughs> Last week was uh was El Chapo. Uh-huh. <laughs> it all goes down here. All right, Lil Nas X. Uh, you got hit with a twenty five million dollar lawsuit over allegedly stealing the song on Old Town Road. Golly, everybody wants some. Let him live. Right. It says Lil Nas X is being sued by the Music Force. The company claims it owns the right to a song called Carry On, which was written by singer Bobby Caldwell and copyrighted by the company in 1983. The company further claims that both Little Nas X and his producer knowingly took the parts of Caldwell's song for their song of the same name. The music force also says that Little Nas X and his producers were completely motivated by greed and malicious intent. When they then proceeded to upload the song online to YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Yo, so this song, it's like one song, but mm-hmm. it's it's taken over the world. They just he just had a, uh, the record for single having the, for the longest longest run at number yeah. 1, what at 17 weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think I don't know if that was last week, so I don't know if it's it's 18 weeks now, but uh, it beat out uh Mariah Boy, Carey yeah. and Boyz II Men for yeah. uh, one sweet day. That song made me cry. So when I heard that, I was like, "God, late." First of all, they didn't even want him to be on the 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 country hit list. Yeah, they don't know where to put him. Yeah, because they just hating on this little black boy. This little gay black boy now. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> he was like, listen, I'm about to be here and represent. Word breaking boundaries. Yes. Hating on him. Go ahead, little Nas. Yeah, people gonna come for that money though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people coming for that money. Twenty five million, bro. Calm down. Get you a get you a co writing credit. Fortnite. Do y'all play Fortnite? Mm. Hate it. 
Why? God don't know how to play. Okay, so <laughs> all right, so we in the same group. But I think I found a reason why I might want to learn how to play. Yeah. Uh, Fortnite gives away three million dollars to his first ever solo world champion. Kid is sixteen years old. Yeah. Uh, beating out other pros and famous streamers, Kyle Booger Gerstoff. He's 16 years old, made a name for himself by dominating from the first round and ultimately taking home the $3 million grand prize for individual players. Wow. This is the largest ever payout for a single player in an e-sport tournament. Y'all want to learn how to play now? No. No. I'm not. Right. All right. All right. Y'all ain't as motivated. But I felt bad for the the um, the kid that lost. He was He won fifth place. But he was so distraught. He won ninety thousand dollars. Uh, no, sorry, nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, he's he, right. He he's still at this straight. point, <laughs> at this point, it wasn't for the money. It was for the title. When you Boy. get that close to being number one and you you make fifth place, it's kind of. I hear that, Michael Jordan. I hear that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you doing it for the title and the respect. Yeah, people got bills to pay. Mama was happy. No, Never. that's a fact. All right, so we're gonna end out our current events with a quote. It's closer, positive. Especially this one coming from Beyonce. Ooh. She says, If everything was perfect, you would never learn. You would never grow. Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I love Beyonce. Did I'm y'all see the Lion King? King? I'm about to see that this weekend. Oh, let me know how it is. Sure. You gonna pay that twenty dollar fee? Hmm, twenty dollars. I think I'm paying um thirty four. Oh, thirty four. What are you doing? What you got a date? I pick. Oh, I pick. Yeah. yeah. How many people you going with? I don't know. Am I am I including that? I mean, you like covering popcorn too? You got military discount? Oh lord, Ooh. come on! <laughs> 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 I can pass as a student. You can't. I can. They don't have student discount because they hate. Yeah, they are. They hate on black don't crack. They know we were like, listen, I'm 55, but I look like a student. Black people are a conspiracy. Mmm, that sounds like a good book. Yes, <laughs> I like that. Somebody gonna run with that. That's a whole YouTube channel right there. I know. Now for our exciting portion of the show, you know what the business always talking about the business, the real story, the real journey of an entrepreneur, of a creative being. What does it take to take your idea to the next level and succeed and continue to succeed and? And to try new things and how to survive and pay your bills and live a, 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 a dynamic life. Because it's easy to look like an entrepreneur on social media. You know, everybody got that as the hashtag. Everybody has it as uh, boss up. Fronting for the gram. Fronting for the gram. Mm-hmm. You know, and ain't nothing wrong with wanting to be a boss of your life. That's important. Don't nobody want to be a slave. It's important. But we want the real answers from the real people actually doing the work. So today, we have with us Mr. Clinton Ballard of Lifestyle Clothing and the Brooklyn Alchemist Station. Woo! How you feeling, brother? Speaking to the mic. We want to hear you. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Awesome, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this interview. No problem. Lifestyle is all over New York, all over the world. Um, the more research I did, because I always, um, I always knew about you. I always, always saw the brand. Um, but the more research I did, and I'm not surprised that you see it everywhere. You know, seeing celebrities, rappers rocking it. Um, the more I read about you, you know, being a teacher, um, having a chemistry degree. You know, um, very impressed with just uh, people that put in work. You know, and um, it, it doesn't seem like this was a, a fluke. You know, and um, sometimes you hear about, you know, rappers or artists that have that that one hit. It's like, boom, success. You know, and so I'm really interested in, in talking to you about just what was your journey um, to get here. And then where are you going? I, I feel like you're a, a really focused man. And um, let's have that conversation. For sure, for sure. Um, so I started out <clears throat> with the idea from me and two of my friends. We had the idea, like, while we were in college, we were like, we should start a clothing brand. And it's towards, like, the end of our college career, and we was just, like, focused on school and graduating. So we never, like, executed. We just, like, played around with the idea. And then when we graduated, we had more free time on our hands. And, you know, we had jobs, but after mm-hmm. 9 to 5, you like, if you're ambitious, you're like, all right, what do I do after work now? I got all the time on my hands. So we would um, 
pursuing different ideas, and one of the ideas that we were working on was a, a non-profit entertainment company called Scholar Rich that one of my other friends, one of the same friends, he came up with the idea, and it was like 100% his idea. Mm-hmm. So I was like kind of helping him with those efforts at Scholar Rich, where we were working on getting after-school programs in the school that kind of focused on engaging curriculum for the minorities because it just felt like education was important, but it just wasn't highlighted. Mm-hmm. So around that time, we're working on Scholar Rich, and um, we wanted to kind of branch off into clothing with mm-hmm. the brand. But we was like, you know what? We should revisit that lifestyle idea that we had a couple years ago. Right. What time period are we talking? What year? This is like 2012 now. Okay. We're like 2012. Um, yeah. Fresh off of like, I would say, um, yeah, about maybe like three years after graduating college. Mm-hmm. We like kind of got comfortable working. And we started like trying to be entrepreneurs more. Right. So, um, working on Scholar Ridge for like about a year. And in the middle of that process, we kind of try to um, do both projects, Scholar Ridge and Lifestyle. So, um, my partner, Kamal, he was kind of more focused on Scholar Ridge, the music, the entertainment, the mm-hmm. after school programming, and our kind of spearheaded lifestyle. And we were like working together, but kind of, you know, autonomous. Like, right, we were able right. To do our own things. And over the years, yeah, I, you know, I just stuck with it. We would keep, continue to work together um, with Lifestyle. Around that time, 2011, 2012, I was screen printing T-shirts in my kitchen. That was like the first thing nice. we, we started out with. Kamal came up with the the, um, the font. Actually, this one that we see right mm-hmm. here. This was like one of the first logos, not this colorway. It was just like black and white, one colorway. Right. And, you know, he had the idea of flipping it upside down and... I'm not sure if you know, but the idea behind it being yeah, go into down. that. Yeah, the idea we had it initially was just to kind of just like be a shock value, like oh, it's upside down, right? It's, it's lifestyle. It's not at that time we didn't want any confusion with the condom company, so we was like, you know, Aha! yeah. So we was <laughs> like, those were the things that we considered, like when you brand in and you're marketing and you don't want any confusion in That's the right. marketplace. So we was like, you know what? Let's put a Y in it. Let's flip it upside down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was just for like shock value and kind of like differentiate ourselves in the market. And then once we put it on shirts, one of the things we noticed like really early on, it was like it's upside down when everybody looks at it. But when you look at it, it's not upside down. And we kind of like built on that. It was like, well, because it's your lifestyle. And, you know, we wanted to like focus the brand on customization and Mm -hmm. letting people do their own thing and express their fashion how they see fit. That's amazing. Yeah, so that was kind of a foundation for the brand early on, where we knew we wanted it to like offer customization and let people kind of do it their way. Mm-hmm. And over the years, so like say that's 2012, um, I was screen printing. Over the years, I just wanted to enhance like the capabilities of lifestyle. So I was in and out of factories in the garment district. I was working with um, other brands, learning, picking a lot of things up. And yeah, I just really enhanced my skill set. And, but, my and this is all while you were you were teaching and yeah. you were doing other things, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is um, I'm doing this after school. So right. at this point, I graduated college. I was working at Johnson and Johnson for a couple of years, three years exactly. And I really didn't like that. I didn't like the, the corporate structure setup. I mm-hmm. didn't like having like a direct boss and then a long hours. So. I, Kamal at that time, my friend partner, mm-hmm. he was already teaching. He was like, "You should look into teaching because it's like you get all these days off. You get out of work at three o'clock. <laughs> right. Your whole summers is free. Like you, you know, you got more time that we could do kind of like scholarship lifestyle on the free time." So I was like, "All right, bet. Let me look into that." So I, I, did, I, I would say that's about twenty, like fifteen. I made the transition from um, pharmaceuticals to teaching. Okay, and. Yeah, 2015 to 2017, 18, Mm -hmm. just working on lifestyle, producing collections, trying to like, you know, learn from my last collection, what worked, what didn't work every season. I'm just trying different things. I'm going to trade shows, I'm meeting people, I'm networking, just trying to enhance my network, enhance my knowledge, my skill set, everything pertaining to fashion. And 2018, like more or less made the decision like... You know, I'm not going to make any more collections because they were costing us too much money. Mm-hmm. It was, it looked good because I thought that was like the standard. Like, if you have a clothing company, right, you, keep you put out collections. Out. Like, you Correct. do these big collections so people can see it and you try to sell your collection. But as I, like I said, you know, four years back to back dropping collections, I was learning a lot. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop doing collections. I'm going to just focus on like one product at a time and just mm-hmm. try to run up, you know, as much sales as I can off of that one product and use that as my model instead of trying to have eight, ten designs in one collection. Right. You like that one, you like that one, and I'm kind of like bouncing all around. I'm spreading myself thin, and my finances just don't allow it. Right, right. So at that point, 
I, one of the first things we did, I remember we did um, these jackets. And we just, instead of doing tops and bottoms, all we did was jackets. And it did pretty good for us. We did maybe like 20 jackets. And we, like, we sold them all. You know, we was making everything at a factory locally. And then at that point, I noticed the benefit of just doing one thing. Like mm-hmm. just doing one thing and just doing it really good. And, you know, you can find a lot of success in that. And a year later, we kind of um, we played around with the patches, putting patches on the sh- on the shirts and garments to kind of replace print. And once we did that, that's kind of what really picked up for us. It was the um, the multicolored lifestyle patch, mm-hmm. and that's like our signature. And that was like tw- the end of 2017, November 2017. We dropped that design. Yeah, and it just did really good for us. The whole 2018 was kind of like really built off of that patch, and us kind of positioning ourselves as a more visible streetwear company and people got more familiar with the sweatsuits started seeing it more so that that journey leading up to it the five years was building a lot of foundation so for some people they think we just came out of nowhere like oh right right that. right but it was like five six years of like like work research that kind of got us to that point and that's amazing that's amazing you are listening to what's the biz on radio free brooklyn our guest today is clinton ballard of lifestyle Brother, tell me, what is your marketing strategy? Like, how do you... Because I know it's a lot of it's word of mouth or just mm-hmm. you see it and like, yo, that's fly. Cause like, that's how I know about it, you mm-hmm. know? Just seeing it um, everywhere. It's almost like, to me, it's like it's like Supreme. I um, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, but like, like yeah. because it's just, it's just all around and you see it, you know more about word of mouth than like um, having it, it like commercials in your face. Yeah. So like, what is your marketing strategy? Um, our marketing strategy is essentially working as closely as we can with influencers, entertainers to kind of help us endorse the brand, promote the brand, Mm -hmm. get us more visible and working with partnerships with bigger companies, organizations that have larger platforms than us. And just, yeah, more definitely like guerrilla style marketing. We like, we don't have a big marketing department. It's me and like two other people that kind of do a lot of day to day. So the one guy who does the marketing, he's on the ground, he's meeting people, he's building relationships that we can kind of leverage for collaborations or partnerships. But a lot of it is just, we're in New York City, like this is like one of the biggest press marketing cities that everybody, every celebrity influence at some point has to come here, comes through the New York. Absolutely. And if your eyes and ears is attentive to like who's in the town and you ambitious, you you know what I mean? You roll you up, catch pull up on That's them, and, you know, let them That's know. If you got good product, a lot of times they it speaks for them so yourself. Like, That's you right. Say, Yo, I got this. You know, I got it on. Oh, I like that. Let That's right. Take it, take, you know, so that's what we do. We just, you know, we've been doing that for two, three years. So we find, you know, we finally built a pretty strong network of people in the entertainment industry. Who's the biggest celebrity that uh, just popped up wearing lifestyle? Probably would be Cardi B or P Diddy. Word, mm-hmm. word. Mm-hmm. That's dope. Yeah, those that's dope. Would be like the two biggest. That's dope. Mm-hmm. And then we got on HBO. That was a big moment. Oh, for real? On what? On what? Insecure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, dope. Yeah, That's what's yeah. So, like, yeah. we're not really public with that, but a lot of people don't know. Like, people asked. We had this, like, really popular Biggie Smalls patch. Mm-hmm. And that was um that was the product that was on uh. Insecure. But it was, as far as I'm concerned, it was when we got that patch on Insecure is... um The sales take off? Not sales. Um, cease and desist took off. Yeah, ah. <laughs> yeah. The sales for that patch were already doing good. Like we were doing really good with that patch. It was like kind of a, it was a, a staple for us being from Brooklyn. Yeah. It was kind of like really um a unique patch design. But when we got on that show shortly after, on the Biggie Estate, Christopher Wallace Estate mm-hmm. issued a cease and desist, and it was like, yeah, I can't, I can't do that hey. no more. So from then, we really kind of stay away from like using things that we don't own, mm-hmm. that we don't own the rights to, or that we didn't license. Because mm-hmm. when we try to market it and get it in these big, you know, this big artist or on this big station. If it's not our rights, if yeah. we don't own the rights to it, we can't even do it. And it just comes back to bite us. Just like we're talking about Lil Nas X. Exactly, you know? right? So, yeah. yeah, you know, and that's what they do a lot of times. They let you run up a big bag. They let you mm-hmm. make $100 million so that they could come back and they, sue you for piece. $20 million. So they look at all the money he made from Right, this. right. So, it's, you know, that was a learning experience for us. So, it was oh, like, man. you know, things you had to involve lawyers. It was Right. What year was this? This was that had been just recently. Yeah, maybe two years ago, two a years? year and a half ago, yeah. going on two years. So that was like kind of like a, a big hurdle that we had to get over at one point. Mm-hmm. But um, it was it's been a very interesting experience, and you know the marketing back to that I think is a big part of like what we try to focus on. Right. That's how people going you know know the brand and feel urged to buy it. That's a fact. That's a fact. 
Uh, tell us about your development on your team and like your management. Because I know at first you said he's making t-shirts in your kitchen. Like that's yeah. a real grind right there. So tell us about your upbringing. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we education, technical background. I don't have a fashion background. I went to school for chemistry because I really like science. Mm-hmm. Um. I find science to just be like really intriguing and I like the kind of amount of work that you got to put in to be successful and good at science. So when I decided to kind of pursue a career in entrepreneurship, what I found to be most transferable from my science background was just the the commitment, the the amount of time that I spent on like perfecting that skill set in the science background is like the amount of time and attention you have to pay to something you don't know anything about mm-hmm. with the fashion so that's what i really took away from it was just like how to like learn something new i learned yeah. how to learn chemistry and an abstract topic like that i picked mm-hmm. it up so fashion was not um something i was familiar with but i picked it up pretty fast yeah that. so i took that away from it and you know throughout the years um i was working a lot with my friends friends that i knew in the neighborhood that helped me come up with the brand and but 2012 we're going on um about six years now seven years that we've had the brand and now the team is like it's um it grew really big and now it's like it's like shrinking yeah um because it's like kind of like um fashion's very up and down Mm -hmm. so in 2018 was a big up for us because it was kind of new to a lot of people we had a really new design so now we're kind of like plateauing out like kind of our norm so now it's like we're kind of like shrinking back down and um I think this is a really important time for us because right now it's like we're just trying to find like the right pieces mm-hmm. to, the, to the company, the puzzle and making it work. And, it's, you know, as the leader, at times it can be challenging because a lot of it falls back on you. Like, you know, yeah. you got to pay people. Yeah. Um, you got to pay rent. You know, you got to perform. Mm-hmm. So um, at times it could be stressful being a leader, but it's entrepreneurship. And I would say like, I've never worked harder in my life than I did. As you said, <laughs> never. Yeah, it's like people. They they. I don't know if some people like entertain the idea of entrepreneurship because they don't want to. They say I don't want to work no more. Like that's mm-hmm. a, a bad statement to mm-hmm. say. Say you don't want to work for somebody, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're gonna find yourself working. You have to work twelve hour days. I'm hour at sixty eight hours of the week. You have to work them all. Yeah, and it's like as the leader, there's there's times when nobody comes in, like. Mm-hmm. Oh, somebody called out or mm-hmm. whatever, but I got to still be there. And I'm, still I'm there from 11 to 7 because those are hours and you got to be consistent. So, yeah, it, it's a lot of work. It's without question. It's, right. You want it to grow. It's more work if you want to. And then and that's the thing. It's like as you grow, it becomes more work, more mm-hmm. expenses. And your first instinct, from, from at least for me, one of my first instincts was to get help. And that's not always the best thing. It's like, sometimes you got to like, just buckle up and, and right. put all that weight, you know, as much as you can on your yeah. own so that you could save as much money as you can. So mm-hmm. when, you know, times in fashion, especially, it's very up and down. Stay lean. Very. Stay, stay lean. lean. And that, yeah. And that's, you know, a very good piece of advice for any entrepreneur is like when you hit a, a successful stride stay lean mm-hmm. don't think oh i, I just made it's gonna last forever. Five, yeah it don't it don't last no. forever and i can tell you that like 2018 was exceptional for us and right you know we we did other investments to kind of grow the company but it's staying lean because now it's like all right it's mellowing down mm-hmm. and we got it like all right who who can we let go who we right. not using and that's right. just the reality of it so stay lean is the more yeah it's unfortunate story. because you get to love your team and you know it's family but it's like oh this is still a business yeah uh-huh. yeah and summer times too and, and, and retail is very slow like okay you know we're a kind of a sweatsuit company like right, you know, that's like right. more of our signature piece and summertime nobody's buying sweatsuits people are traveling you know they went basketball shorts white mm. beaters so in the fashion you got to be prepared for that you got to think like I was, I was talking to my team like about that like I'm just curious what Montclair sells are in the summer right, like, right it has right, to right. be non-existent like they're like a premier winter coat, like twelve hundred dollars on a bubble coat, but you don't buy no coats. Yeah, in the what do they the do summer. during the summer? So that's what I noticed. I, I was mindful of that. They did a Palm Angels collab. Okay. Like they did a big collab. They they um they picked up Will Smith. That's like one of his oh, first wow. clothing ads in like forever. He's wow. never done a clothing ad, and they just aired that. So the, the marketing. So that's what it looks like. Is like a lot of the bigger companies spend more on marketing around this time. Got it. But that's, you know, it. if you can afford it. I can't afford right. that type of marketing. We do you lean gotta, you gotta gorilla marketing. You got to go where it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, you know, those are the things that, like, you learn yeah. throughout, you know, being in this for, like, I don't really feel that 
I haven't had a business this whole 2012 run. Mm-hmm. 20, the top of 2018 marked a business for me because okay. that's when it became to the point where I could quit my job. I could right. pay people. I could pay rent. I got an infrastructure. So in 2018, I'm like one full year mm-hmm. going into my second mm-hmm. full year. So it's still very new to me. Oh, that's still, amazing. You know, and that's why I try to at times, you know, it would be great if you could have like mentors in this, but right. <laughs> the fashion is not like that. Nobody wants to help. No. Nah. Did you see the interview with Dapper Dan? Did, yeah, did, he, he's, yeah, he's yeah. doing his run. Yeah, um, yeah, I gotta get that. the book. Yeah, but mm-hmm. yeah, so even like him, like having to go underground, yeah. and you know him dealing with uh, being sued as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. for using mm-hmm. Gucci. And but all I that. asked some of my friends. I didn't read the book, but I asked them. Like, I'm interested in insight and how to run yeah. a business and fashion. You spoke to him. Um, I didn't. I met Dapper Dan in the past before, but not like recently since okay. he's been getting all this press. But my friends who've read the book, mm-hmm. and once they told me that he's not like giving you no secrets and the ins and out of fashion, I wasn't uh, really interested. Okay, but you know, like his story nonetheless is very yeah. interesting and intriguing. But like right now, my time, I just want to try to grab in as much that's the f- fashion yeah. business. And yeah. he was, you know, <clears throat> during the interviews, he was definitely dropping some jewels mm-hmm. and some things I took away, some really good jewels, but. That's what I'm in right now. It's just like how to run a fashion company. That's what I'm trying to Right, learn. right. So so he was talking about um, he wants to be the expense of the luxury brand. Yeah. You know, how do you price, you know, your... Because uh, it's affordable. Um, how do you price uh, your your clothing? Um, and who do you think about is like your client? Like, how do you go about determining yeah, that? That, like... That was one of the biggest took away, takeaways I took away from the interview with Dapper Dan was with, when he spoke about luxury yeah. and the pricing and things like that. So for us, like we we aren't viewed, for at least from my experience with customers, they don't view us as a necessarily cheap brand. Right, right, right. And it's a lot of things that go into play with that. So it would be different if we were, if I was back in my kitchen making stuff out mm-hmm. my kitchen where there's no overhead. Right. So what a lot what I try to communicate with the customers is our t-shirts are $80 mm-hmm. uh, with a patch. Our sweatshirts are 120 So they like often ask, like, why does it cost so much? Mm-hmm. But one is, like, we make it domestically. Like, our factory is two floors. Right. We have um, about 2,000 square feet. Our rent in just the factory alone is $5,000. Mm-hmm. And then we have all of these different patches for customers to pick from. So we have, a, like, a huge inventory. We have a sewer on staff. Mm-hmm. We have all of these different blanks that they can pick from. So when you come in and... You, we give you the option to pick from 20 different colors and 20 right. different patches. Mm-hmm. Like, we have to sit on that. It's actually right. paid for. And we have to pay for the space to allow for that. And even if nobody comes in today, our soul is waiting upstairs for work. For yeah. So, like, these are the things that goes into our price when we when we factor in our price. So, just throwing numbers out there. Let's say that sweater may only cost us $30 to make, $40 to make. Mm-hmm. We can't sell it for 80 because right. it's just too much overhead associated with right. our business. Right. And that's when the price may go from like, oh, it costs us $40, but we may have to sell it for 150 150 yeah. Because it's just... At least a one to three yeah, ratio. Yeah, because those more. are the things that you have to factor in. All right, if I only sell four shirts today, this yeah. week, can I pay my bills? Right. And if I sell my shirt for $40, there's no way those four shirts are going to help me pay my mm-hmm. bills. And those are the kind of things that I do understand about a Gucci or Louis Vuitton and they pricing. Like, mm-hmm. they got Fifth Ave Real Estate. They are dropping full collections every year. Mm-hmm. They go big deals in marketing. There's a lot of money that goes into present. Like, I'm not right. justifying a $900 sweater. Right. But what I am saying is that they have right to charge well over what the item cost them to make mm-hmm. just to pay their bills. But that's what I try to communicate most right. importantly with the like our community and our customers that... They'll come in to Lifestyle, $120 sweater, and they like, yeah, I can't get it for $100 or, mm-hmm. you know, there you can't look out for me. It's like, one, I can't just because the business structure. And then two, like, why are you doing that to me as a small company? Exactly. <laughs> you don't do that exactly. to Louis or Gucci when they charge you $800 exactly. for that sweater and you can't even speak to Louis Vuitton mm-hmm. or nobody last name Vuitton. Mm-hmm. Like, so those are the things that I really just try to communicate with the customer. Like I could help you out in other ways, but I can't change that price. And it I is what it right. is because you might be my only customer for today and I need that $120. Right. Like, right. So those are the things that we really try to communicate. And like, yo, we made in America. We're not making our stuff mm-hmm. overseas in China. We got an American sewer, like, you know, sewn in Brooklyn and that's that amazing. Was, no, and I, I, I use the term affordable. One, it's affordable for hip hop because hip hop will spend the money. Oh, that's hip hop spends money. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, so even like you go to Nipsey's store. You know, Nipsey was selling the mixtape for a hundred. Yeah. You know, plain T shirts. You know, for a hundred. Mm-hmm. And so it's like it goes back to one. You, 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 one, you're buying into the brand. You're buying into what it takes to actually put this together. You know, and so in any in any culture, like if you go there. 
and like I want the best, like you know, you want it, and like your 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 gear is quality, and so definitely if, we focus on that. Yeah, yeah, and you can tell, you can tell. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so and so I think that's like part of it's like, do you want something that's gonna last? Particularly like men's clothing, mm-hmm. right? Men's clothing is always gonna be more expensive because you have to have quality. Mm-hmm. You know, it has to be quality or it's gonna fall apart. Mm-hmm. And so, um. Yeah, I think it's affordable. You know, men got money. Y'all yeah, got money. Yeah, you know, I, I <laughs> get it. I know it. And you know, the reality with the black community is maybe that we think we have more money than we actually have. So, like, sometimes when people come into the store where they may have a family and they buy a bunch of stuff, I do try to offer discounts. Cause I get like, yeah. all right, back to school's coming around. The family may not have all the money that for the stuff that the kid wants. And right. I get that. Like, yeah. sometimes the kids put pressure on you because, like, yeah. we're big in the um the adolescents, the youth, they high schools from like junior high to high school. A lot mm-hmm. of kids come in asking for lifestyle, mm-hmm. so I know that the parents could get the pressure from the kids. So I, I try to like you know like work things out, and we do back to school sales, and we do back to school giveaways because I get that I'm part of this culture, the community. Yeah. I get everything, the dynamics that go on with us wanting things that we can't always afford. Yeah. So, you know, I just try to find that middle ground with it all, though. Um, about two or three shows ago, we had on uh, uh, Kirk Remedy from uh, Making It Look Cool. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Not. He actually has um, he actually, uh, he has his clothing line, but then he makes uniforms for the school. Have mm-hmm. you ever thought about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're working on partnerships with that right nice. now. We're actually, Williamsburg Charter High School is mm-hmm. like a local, like a couple blocks away. Nice. We're working on a partnership with them and one at this, um, a charter school on Organs Martin campus, but for similar wow. things like that. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So going back to that Scholar Rich where we were yeah. doing after school programs and in- injecting ourselves into the schools. So now with the platform that we have with Lifestyle, we're trying to kind of revisit that and like inject got lifestyle it. into got schools it. and we got fashion programs and fashion clubs promoting entrepreneurship showing nice, kids how nice. to like make clothes and turn ideas into reality that's awesome that's yeah. awesome you had a question yeah so i know lifestyle is like straight i'm straight out of high school so all my peers they they rock lifestyle they wanted lifestyle um i'm from east new york brooklyn okay. um what part of lifestyle from where are you from well i'm from brownsville initially Ooh, born okay. and raised but I grew up in kind of bed style. That's more okay. or less where I went to junior high school, high school at. A lot of my friends was from the um Yo, so I feel Clint like Hills I might have met you before. Possibly. Do you know Kayla? Um Kayla Rivera. A Puerto Rican sister. She's from Bed Stuy. She's an organizer activist. Possibly. Possibly, right? <laughs> there was a time in my life where I was very involved in like yeah. the activism and community. Well, no, stuff. no, we were like I was I was I was just at her house hanging. We went to the oh, store okay. and she introduced me from somebody from Lifestyle. And I was like, I wonder if it's him or it's not. You know what I mean? Like it was a foggy day. <laughs> it was a cloudy nah, day. Nah, definitely. You know, that could have definitely been. How long ago was this? Man, it might have been like two years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That could have been. And if it was you, you were mad, humble, okay. you know, respectful. Because I, I think I had asked for an interview because I, I also do a TV show. Mm-hmm. And he was like, nah, you know, I was just working on the brand. You know, I'm a celebrity or something. something that, real could possibly, that could have possibly been me because cool, I know my cool. other partners would have ate up that opportunity. Oh, okay. Because, like, yeah, this is like probably one of the first interview I've done. Like, I don't really. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, no I asked two years ago. <laughs> yeah. But we're at the point now where I feel that, like, we have to get the brand story out more. People, Word. like, kind of got to know. Like, I want them to know it's black owned. I want yeah. them to know our community efforts and things like that everything that we're doing so I'm now I'm like we need press now we need Word. to be out there more so Word. we got you Young Boss Media got you appreciate that's y'all awesome. Definitely, that's awesome definitely. what college did you go to by the way uh, so I just I went to um, high school I went to Bishop Lachlan and then high college I went to Temple mm-hmm. and I went to Long Island University and Pace so I had two masters okay nice. mm-hmm. awesome what are the masters in my first master's was in drug regulatory affairs when I was working in Johnson & Johnson because mm. I just kind of knew that I was okay. going to be like a director of a, regular affairs, okay. a regulatory affairs department. Like that was like my mission. I was like, I'm going to like run a pharmaceutical department. But wow. that was something like what I realized early on and Noriega worded it recently in the Drink Champs. Like mm-hmm. I don't want to work somewhere where I'm tolerated. Like, I want to be appreciated. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the pharmaceutical, yeah. it was like a young black male, an old white industry. Yeah. They was just dealing with me. Yeah. Where I was like, or one thing I noticed about education, like, you're valued as a black mm-hmm. male. It's like, you're a black male teaching science. Oh, we, we want you here. And, Correct. You know, so that, that right. was one thing. So that was made the switch real easy. Like, and I respect him in that. Anybody, when you're trying to find a, a career or passion, 
like make sure it's something that you love and like that industry appreciates you oh that's amazing and that's what i said about luxury like as black people we always want to like be these luxury brands but they don't really appreciate us in that luxury mm-hmm. market like us as like creatives and us as like designers mm-hmm. so it's like i'm you know i feel that we kind of got to do our own thing like I, I agree and like you know, agree. not trying to piggyback off of these big brands like just do our own thing appreciate yeah. our own culture our own products that we putting out i absolutely agree uh, what made you want to go into pharmaceuticals? Where'd that that dream come from? Um, I was good in science in high school, and uh, I was I was just trying to like figure it out. Eleventh, twelfth grade. I remember twelfth, like eleventh grade, AP English. One of them AP English mm-hmm. class. I had to write a persuasive essay. Oh God! On, um, <laughs> it was on like the ethics in the pharmaceutical company and like what they do with the money. Mm-hmm. And I just saw how much money was in the pharmaceutical industry and like how much money they were spending on marketing. Got it. And I was like, okay, it's, it's money here, so I'll be a pharmacist. And right. then that was my initial Got goal it. was to be a pharmacist. And then the more I learned, I was like, oh, I can actually work for a pharmaceutical company. Mm-hmm. And that was it. So it was just really. So let me ask you this: Does does the chemistry help you when it comes to like it was like textile and like um? It what? it can like it, it can, you know. So like if you look at somebody like Virgil. Like he's really um, good at what he does because mm-hmm. I feel that he uses his architecture background and it impacts his design. Mm-hmm. And you need a lot of money and time for that because you got to try a bunch of things and you got to have the money to keep trying it. Right. So to be honest, I feel I don't have the luxury to like intertwine my chemistry knowledge and my science background and kind of create a aesthetic that will allow right. that to like be reflected right so that's the reality I, I don't really get to use it for the like the creative technical side of mm-hmm. it i would love to like have a brand and designs and collections that kind of stem from you know you see the creative origin like oh because he has a science background and you know his use right. of chemistry you know that just takes you know that takes playing <laughs> trying things yeah and that <laughs> takes you like trying that seeing how people like it oh they not liking it like yeah. for us like we're a small company it's real we got like real bills that hit us every it. month yeah. so it's like you can't spend a thousand dollars this month on r&d trying stuff when we know we got you know right. real, real reorders to can do and new patches that we got to get coming in that's so, right that's right i wish i could more of the stories i don't but i yeah. wish i could be more kind of like creative in that sense well it's it's in it's in the cabinet you know it's yeah, one of the ingredients in the cabinet it's so definitely you something know. to consider down the yeah. line when i you know when Maybe we I'm sitting on like an excess of money and I want right. to try like you know what let's try this aesthetic right, out right mm-hmm. right right awesome awesome you are listening to what's the biz we are interviewing Clinton Ballard of Lifestyle on RadioFreeBrooklyn.org and if you like to listen to Radio Free Brooklyn when you're not in front of your computer on your phone on the go download the free mobile app on your iPhone or Android at RadioFreeBrooklyn.org awesome awesome so um. Back to the celebrities that you had in um, my research, I, I saw that you in like um, because the stores they would get so packed, um, you had to have like have um, warehouses and mm-hmm. stuff like that to keep the inventory. And then I saw that you had like people come through like six nine, mm-hmm. um, and I know like celebrities, you know, they don't like to stand on long lines. But how was your your Interaction? Did you interact with Six Nine? Yeah. How, yeah. how did he treat the brand? Or how he did was he cool. The Six, you know, Six Nine was very cool and very approachable and showed a lot of love. Like, um, there's not a lot of celebrities that we've interacted with that like bounce the energy off. Like, you know, you you show and they give it back to you and they do things on their own time. Six Nine was definitely like that. Like, you know, he wore it on his own. Like, we were friends with his DJ mm-hmm. Punch, and he's like a really good friend of the, of ours and of the brand. So, you know, Punch informed them, like, other brands, like, yo, you should come check them out. And it was just always good energy, you know. Unfortunate everything that, you know, happened to him that he had to go through and, mm-hmm. you know, the situation that he's going through now yeah. with his brand and everything that he, you know, transpired. But I don't got nothing bad to say, you know. Unfortunately, like, hip-hop just don't really kind of shine a good light on everything that, he, you know, happened with him. But Word. it was good energy with him. Where I see that you, um, that the... That the motive was to hit young people first with with lifestyle. And what what was the goal in doing that and to trigger in like the young eyes to the brand? Yeah, so one, like I know that the youth like hold like the real stake on kinda like what's cool and 
what's next. So that was like yeah. a no brainer for me. It's like, all right, I'm like late twenties at this point. Do I target people who are like post college careers? Like that's not really who kind of dictates like what's cool. So I taught high school. It was like me and my my partner. We both were in the school, so it just made sense. Like now, focus on the, the the youth, the kids, because those are the ones that go to their parents. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that got the biggest reach. So yeah, that was like part of our marketing strategy, definitely. Do you have kids? Nah, I don't. I'm okay. You want kids? Mm, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, like I tell people all the time, like lifestyle is my kid. Like, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And that's the reality. Is like, is like I spend so much time working on this, like every day. Mm-hmm. I spent so much money on this, and it's just like I at times I can't even think about thinking about something else but life. Right. So yeah, I created right. a girlfriend, a kid. I, you know, it's just kind of not realistic for me. Mm-hmm. Nah, that's real. That's real. I just got a cat like two months ago, and it's like, nah, I can't be no parent. Nah, yeah, I got a dog, <laughs> but you know, even when I got my dog, it was because I wanted to start selling dog clothes for lifestyle. And oh. I was like, everything for me goes back yeah, to the yeah, brand. Yeah. And it's like, I right, bet I got me a little model now. I got an action <laughs> ball with my dog, and you know. I'm waiting for it to get back hoodie season so he can start right, working. So right. right now he's just in the crib being annoying. <laughs> he cool though. But um but that's what I tell people too. It's like again, I took that from from going to college and a, a science degree. Mm-hmm. I'm used to locking myself in a room studying for four, six hours. Right. All I'm doing is the same thing now with lifestyle. Right. I tell people that a lot of times it's like that's what you use school for. Practice your your skill set. Like, I agree. Because now I get interns, I get people interested in working, but their work ethic is terrible. Mm-hmm. They can't they can't focus for long periods mm-hmm. of time. They can't, you know, remember multiple things, mm-hmm. you know. So that's what I try to promote to the students, you know, the young adults is like, nah, college has value. You right, know, you shouldn't right. be spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a college degree and right. be in debt, no. But mm-hmm. you should definitely be learning how to work on something for four years Absolutely. and get a finished result, Absolutely. which is your degree. And, and, and those four years are important because it might take four years for it to pop yeah. or longer. Yeah, like Amazon took about five years to pop. Right. Like even for me, lifestyle, like from 2012, I didn't see profit until 2018, six mm-hmm. years. But mm-hmm. I was comfortable with that because I was already used to working for long periods of time on mm-hmm. things. So right. Being patient. A lot of people think it's going to happen like overnight. It's yeah, like that's very important. Years. Personally, what's your favorite lifestyle um, design that you made? Um, Personally... I'm going to be cliche. I'm going to say it is like the, the regular multicolor, the first multicolor, mm-hmm. because it's so versatile. I could wear it like all the time. If mm-hmm. I ever go go to another state, I always wear it because I yeah. just like it, it pops out so much. And yeah, it's just so versatile. It's, it pops out a lot. So I get why it's like our best seller. So for me, it's like just everything that is done for the company yeah. and the versatility. Do you only have shirts? And Mm-mm. sweaters Mm-mm. Yeah we got like Everything, everything. I love slides. the slides I yeah. love the slides we got yeah, I'm about slides. to I'm about mm-hmm. to cop Shoot. Yeah mm-hmm. we're about to um, by Hopefully everything goes well By like September we'll be getting Into like home We'll be doing like um Sheets and blankets Curtains oh, That's dope, that's yeah. dope. That's dope. Okay. We'll be getting into that That's kind of like Spreading the lifestyle brand Yeah I'm gonna get that from my How dorm. do you Cause you, you talked about that earlier About like uh, Slowing down and doing Different collections um, what made you go into this, um, into that expansion? Yeah, right. So everything makes sense. One is like, I think it's important that we kind of um, allow the brand to be distinguished. And I don't see a lot of streetwear brands getting into home decor and doing the kind of things that I'm interested in doing. Mm-hmm. So it gives us that kind of like uniqueness. Like, oh, they doing sheets. Like, I don't see many people doing sheets. And then the reality is, is uh, plus around the same time, September, we'll be releasing a bubble coat that we make. Okay. And my logic was like, well, a bubble coat and a blanket is very similar in construction. Mm. Like, you got to stuff it, you got to quilt it. So I was like, that goes hand in hand in production. So when I'm making my bubble coat, as far as my soles go, it's nothing to like right. run, a, run a blanket with that as well. And sheets and those things are very easy to make. So like, those aren't hard items to make. So... That was the logic behind it. It all started from the bubble coat, then going into the blanket. And I was like, well, we might as well do a whole bed, a yeah. whole bed seat. Genius. All right. So you said the word production. I love production. I love yeah, me media too. production. I like, I'm, I'm all in it. I used to watch a lot of how things made. Yeah. yeah I, I love yeah. to watch that show. Me too. Yeah, yeah, I'm me into too. production and processes. Very much so. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm into the work. Yeah. I'm really into the work. So tell me like, what does production look like for you? Yeah. Um, so production for us is um cutting and sewing, mm-hmm. um, clothing, um, so buying fabric or, or getting fabric from 
some type of fabric supplier and we're using patterns Mm -hmm. um which essentially kind of like the blueprint for the clothing you lay it over the fabric and it tells you how to cut it right you know the width i I remember like you know like my mom or grandma would try to teach me how to sew and so we get the patterns and you cut it around exactly so it's just like a like an overlay you put it on top of the fabric and you cut it and it'll be like the shape of what you need and then you go to the sewers like i don't do i can do cutting but i don't really do any sewing it's just Mm -hmm. not my my expertise got it um, so we're passing that after we cut it, we pass that over to the sewers. The sewers are producing it, and that could take depending on the item, uh, like a it could go from a shirt to a coat, which could take from fifteen minutes to six hours, mm-hmm. like depending on what we're making. Man. But that's kind of like ultimately our production is looking like that, though. Oh man, I love it. So um, I know this week, and you guys are actually having a, a making clothes workshop, mm-hmm. and um, I will be going. But you want to give a little, not too much, but you want to give yeah. a little insight of what that workshop um, is going to be about or who should be going? For sure. Um, so one thing I do because I, I have a factory and I have production ability is I make clothes for other brands and other people mm-hmm. who may just want custom, custom clothing. And a lot of times, um, a lot of the individuals just don't know about the process. They don't know about patterns. They don't mm-hmm. know about grading. They don't know about fabric. They don't know the difference between a patch, embroidery, chenille, mm. you know, different things like that. So, a lot of times, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time just educating the, the potential customer. Mm-hmm. And that can be draining at times. It's like, you know, like, all right, you got to... It's beneficial when you kind of know things already. So, this workshop right here, I'm just kind of giving whoever attends, like, the the 101 crash course on how to make clothes like all right, it. where do you get the fabric from what is a pattern who makes patterns what does it mean to be graded what's the difference between a chenille patch what's the difference between an embroidery patch mm. what's um, cut and sew what's print what's screen print what's digital print just giving them a big r- overall rundown yeah so that if you have these ideas now you can better like kind of communicate what you want yeah exactly like Speak to the, the language. so what into yeah. your mind like all right well that's that i can't do it this way but let me think about trying it this way so that is the idea of it is just to kind of like empower and educate anybody who attends that let them know like everything is in new york city like literally yeah. one of the mm-hmm. best cities to live That's in for fact. fashion everything is here. like like some of these big companies do they sample in here because mm-hmm. there's so many of the machinery and equipment is here so this is like a great city to, for you to get that stuff done and that's what is the um the purpose of the workshop overall is just to let people know it's here if you want to go get it the place is here the information is here it's just your commitment how would you suggest yeah how would you suggest uh, if somebody has an idea like how to get into the fashion industry um it's it's one of the easiest industries to enter and that's why you may see like or it feels oversaturated or everybody has a clothing brand because Mm -hmm. what people call clothing brands like hat and t-shirt and they say they got a clothing Mm -hmm. brand so it's not hard to enter like social media Mm -hmm. squarespace shopify paypal it's so easy to like you know to set it up the hardest part is like growing it and keep it sustaining right yeah it's not hard it's just go to garment district get the fabric talk to some factories build your you know build your network up get your production consistent yeah and start running where your you find the, Where you find the factories from? Where do, like where do you? Um, just being around, like they're all over the garment district. A okay. lot of them in the up, like up uh-huh. building. So like, you ask got, questions. Yeah, yeah. You just a lot of time the fabric, the fabrics is on the bottom. Downstairs, yeah, and then you just ask them like, do you know any factories upstairs? Got and they let you know like, yeah, yeah, third floor, Dang. fourth floor. <laughs> yeah, Dang. it's really that simple. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but and then it comes to like the budgeting. Like right. it's Manhattan, it's gonna be expensive. So mm-hmm. like they may charge you. Like you may have this idea. Oh, I want to get a shirt made. I got the fabric. Like if you don't have the pattern, they'll charge you two hundred dollars just to get a pattern made uh. in the city. And then they'll charge you like one hundred and fifty just to make one. Mm-hmm. So you're spending three hundred and fifty dollars. So it's an investment, and you got to kind of know how to maneuver through it. Got it. So those are one of the things that I offer for like companies or brands that come to me. Like if you want to do cut and sew, I have a lot of patterns already. I've been doing it for a while, so you could use my patterns. Amazing. Kind of offset your course and things like that, but it can be costly though. I will say that. So yeah. there's different ways to go about it, and that's something we talk about at the workshop is the difference between making clothes in America versus making clothes overseas, which is way cheaper. Right. You just have to order larger amounts, but that's where the real money is made. It's way cheaper overseas or here? Yeah, overseas. overseas like, right, yeah, right. it's that's where you like gotta wait forever. Yeah, so you gotta think like if a company like throw a Prada out there, right? If mm-hmm. a company like Prada can make their stuff in China, mm-hmm. like they're gonna win, like right. because. The customer is comfortable spending three hundred, two hundred dollars on a Prada T-shirt. Already, yeah. Like it makes sense if they're making it in Italy. Like, yeah. okay, it's you know top of the top, 
fabric suppliers, you know, sewers. But if they could do, if they could mimic that quality in China mm-hmm. and sell it to the customer, they're gonna win because Absolutely. they're gonna now, you know, two dollars and sell you yeah. for two hundred. Yeah. So that's why, I, like, one thing I tell people it's is like, that's what look up. at what country the place is made in when you when they talk about pricing because mm-hmm. that's your impact pricing, like. Italy, Turkey, Portugal, those are like higher cost production mm-hmm. places. But China, Japan should be a little bit lower. That's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. What is the future of lifestyle? Um, Definitely um, being more of like holistic with the brand, getting into more industries like fitness, home, mm-hmm. um, using the brand, the equity, like just the notoriety and kind of um, using our platform to better impact the community and the schools Mm -hmm. i'm really big on education yeah so it's kind of like i want to use that on my lifestyle platform to promote education i'm amazing amazing Mm -hmm. thinking a little further in 20 years where you want to be at um hopefully lifestyle be sold like i'm not you want to sell it yeah i'm definitely you know into in like in entertaining the idea of like selling it and presenting it to be sold so Mm -hmm. I would love to do that, like, you know, eventually cash out and move on to, like, another endeavor. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. Would you still keep, like, some kind of, you know, like a small percentage of ownership, or would you just give it 100% up? You know, depends what we negotiate. I'm not, like, I'm not, like, um, emotionally attached to it. It's I hear that. a project that I worked on, and I'm ready, you know. Yeah, flip to it. cut it course. Yeah, that thing, that's the purpose of business. It's yeah. It's, like, to, to present it for that big cash out. Like, mm-hmm. spend a lot of hours and millions of dollars into this company at this point. So, now it's, like... So, that cash out. So, so right quick I want I was uh, interested in knowing what is the Brooklyn Alchemist station so that's the factory that's the okay. factory component to the company that's mm-hmm. where we are making clothes so let's say you want to get some t-shirts made like the invoice would come from Brooklyn Alchemist station got it got it so the, that's next door yeah that's it's we're all in the same building so got lifestyle it. is the retail is on the first floor mm-hmm. the ground level and upstairs the lifestyle production but also the bka station production Got facility it. as well okay yeah. okay cool mm-hmm. so i know being an entrepreneur you know you have your rough days you have your good days um but what motivates you most to keep going on your good days on your bad days sorry good question. Mm. just like the the idea and the reality like what else like, all right, if I don't get out of my bed and do this, then what? I'm a, like, what am I going to do? It's just the reality is that I'm in so deep that there's no turning back for me. Like, good day or bad day, just is like no excuses. So, you know, I yeah. definitely know you, you, I get it all. Like, really good times, really bad times, but it's about like keeping your poise and just, you know, having good mental space to like, yeah. all right, it's a bad day. I got to get it done. Yeah, most importantly. Yeah, it, it, I will tell you that, though. You got to be mentally strong in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Because yeah. it gets discouraging. Like, you can start questioning your, yeah. your idea. Mm-hmm. Like, is this going to work? And, you know, it's not paying off. So, mm-hmm. you know. What do you do to relax? Um, what do I do? I'll be like, I don't know. Can I say I smoke? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, then, like, that's it. Like, if I'm not working, like, I. It's it cloudy. Yeah, like, I, I smoke a little weed, but I'm even trying, I'm really trying to cut cut that out and, yeah. like, and find more productive ways to, like, cope with my downtime. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's really it. Like, I work a lot. I just want to, I, I watch movies, I smoke, and I eat, and I could get, and you, you know, go to sleep and yeah. do it back over yeah. again. So, yeah, I just wanted, like, I want to incorporate more working out, more healthy eating, mm-hmm. like, stuff like that, because I work so much that right. sometimes I justify to myself, well, I got a lot done today. I could I could relax. I could do this. Right, like, right, I could right. smoke some weed, and I could right. do these detrimental things. But it's like, nah, you got to keep it, you know, holistically. I love it. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, Clint, thank you so much for coming, man. No problem. Man. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I definitely would love to have you on other programs, other shows. For sure. You know, for um, sure. Yeah. And if I come across any interesting people, I definitely like, you know, forward for sure. them over to you Please. and let you know. Please. What type of people are you guys generally interested in interviewing? Entrepreneurs. You know, Young okay. Boss, we're all about entrepreneurship and like really getting down to like, how is it done? Mm-hmm. You know? And so we know social media can make it look easy, but like, we know that that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. we want to know like, yo, what's the process? How are you doing this? Mm-hmm. And so hopefully somebody listening this will be inspired to say all right so all i gotta do is go down to the garment district mm-hmm. and, and talk to the factory all right cool I, sure. got, I got a great idea okay sometimes we just need to hear it from ourselves you know no no i definitely know a lot of people who are doing different things in the entrepreneur awesome. you know 
retail industry space. So I would definitely fold them over to you. Love it. Thank you mm-hmm. so much. No problem. You are listening to What the Biz. Monica Sackmack, Grant, Samira, Issa, Justin Woo. Ivory with our guest, Clinton Ballard of Lifestyle. This was a great interview. Yes, Hope you learned a lot. If you would like to learn more or hear past episodes, please go to RadioFreeBrooklyn.org. Look for the show, What's the Biz? You can see the show page. And uh, if you want to become a sponsor, please do. We need the funding. I need your money. If you want to keep this thing going, we got to have some gas in the tank, please. (laughs) Uh, but just keep showing love. Uh, like us on all social media platforms, Young Boss Media. You know, we're doing a thing. Drink never enough coffee. And peace and love to everybody. Love yourself. God bless. Tuesday early morning from midnight to 2 a.m. Catch Mood Indigo for your weekly dose of blue tunes and sad poems here on Radio Free Brooklyn. Tune in and cry it out with me, DJ Susan. This is Jorge, your hurdy gurdy man and host of Hurdy Gurdy Songs. Join me for a program that features songs created for and by social movements, cultural survivors, and political resistors right here on RadioFreeBrooklyn.org Dirty Dirty Songs every Tuesday live at 2 p.m. Lush Vibes Radio is a music show highlighting the more immersive, atmospheric, ambient sonic textures of all the genres you love to all the genres you didn't know you loved. Tune in and vibe out with me, Calvin Williams, Wednesday mornings from midnight to 1 a.m. on Radio Free Brooklyn. Free Brooklyn. Hello, Radio Free Brooklyn. The hour is 6 o'clock p.m. And you and I are about to blast off on a space flight into the far reaches of dub.
city, first one in a while. Felt the sun beating down. Had a chance to do some swimming this weekend. And really I'm feeling refreshed and ready for the week ahead. And there's really nothing better for navigating and clarifying that liminal space between week in and week out than the meditative sounds of dub reggae. This next track comes from the British dub master Dennis Bovell. This is a dub from his original band Matumbi. This track is called A Jolly. <laughs> Sunday evening together. Dread, double dub. 